powerful goodbye. Evangelist Billy Graham is laid to rest in Charlotte before a crowd that includes the president. Stock market jitter. U.S. tariffs on imported steel and aluminum have an immediate impact on Wall Street. Debate rages on. Lawmakers have different ideas on how to address gun control. The conversation continues. And promoting unity. Pope Francis is heading to Switzerland later this year. We discuss what he's hoping to achieve. On EWTN News Nightly for Friday, March 2nd, 2018. Mourners gathered to pay respects to the Reverend Billy Graham, a man known to many evangelicals as America's pastor. Good evening from Washington, D.C., and thank you for joining us for news from a Catholic perspective. I'm Wyatt Goolsby, in for Lauren Ashburn. Today's funeral in Charlotte, North Carolina, came after more than a week of tributes. Graham's five children and pastors from around the world made remarks, but one of the more poignant moments came when his sister spoke. And I was reminded when I heard that my brother died of the song that the choirs used to sing, heaven came down and filled my soul with glory. On February the 21st, heaven came down and took my brother from me. The funeral was invite only. About 2,000 people attended, including President Donald Trump, Vice President Mike Pence, and their wives. Graham brought a message of salvation to millions here in the U.S. and around the world. He died last week at the age of 99. White House Chief of Staff John Kelly admits he could have done a better job handling the Rob Porter case. Porter is the former White House Staff Secretary who resigned after two of his ex-wives accused him of domestic abuse. Kelly told a small group of reporters today he did not know about the allegations until the media started asking questions on February 6th. He says his comments supporting Porter came before he knew about the alleged physical abuse. President Trump doubles down on his claim that punishing taxes on U.S. imports would be good for the country, but his intended policy will likely raise prices on steel and aluminum products. White House correspondent Mark Irons reports. Good evening, Mark. Good evening, Wyatt. The president says he will raise taxes 25 percent on steel imports, 10 percent on aluminum imports. But this proposal is causing concern among international trading allies, the automobile industry, and even Republican lawmakers. 25 for steel, 10 for aluminum. President Trump stirs international backlash after announcing the U.S. will impose steep tariffs on steel and aluminum imports. The news prompted a sharp drop on Wall Street Thursday, but the president insists trade wars are good. He tweets, when a country, USA, is losing billions of dollars on trade with virtually every country it does business with, trade wars are good and easy to win. Example, when we are down $100 billion with a certain country and they get cute, don't trade anymore. We win big. It's easy. Members of the president's own party are pushing back. Senator Ben Sass of Nebraska, also a vocal pro-life supporter, believes American jobs will suffer. Sass writes, trade wars are never won. Trade wars are lost by both sides. Kooky 18th century protectionism will jack up prices on American families and will prompt retaliation from other countries. Senator John McCain echoes those concerns, tweeting, the president's sweeping tariffs will only serve to hurt American workers and consumers and alienate us from our most important allies and trading partners. The Trade Association for Britain's steel industry says the tariff will affect the UK's trading relationship with the US. These kind of tariffs will really impact on our ability to compete in those markets and understandably, you know, imports um, from um, into the US from the UK will reduce. And the American International Automobile Dealers Association warning the tariffs would drive up prices substantially. President Trump isn't backing down. He tweets, we must protect our country and our workers. Our steel industry is in bad shape. If you don't have steel, you don't have a country. Illinois Republican Representative Mike Bost supports the president, calling the taxes a bold step forward to stop unfair trade practices. White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders noted the president has been talking about this idea for years, so she says his plan to tax imports shouldn't come as a surprise. The president says this plan will be completed and go into effect at some point next week. Wyatt. White House correspondent Mark Irons reporting. Thanks, Mark.
We're learning new information tonight about the deputies who responded to the school shooting in Florida. The Miami Herald reports a sheriff's office captain told those deputies to form a perimeter instead of confronting the gunman inside the school. The officers had been criticized for not entering the building. Investigators are looking into the police response to the shooting where a gunman killed 17 people, including 14 students. Congressional action on gun reform skids to a halt, but lawmakers are still working on the issue in the wake of the shooting. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvey spoke to senators before taking their weekend recess. Hello, Jason. Wyatt, Republicans are squirming over the president's call Wednesday for stricter gun laws, but now a tweet over what he's calling a great meeting with the NRA is leaving many GOP members scrambling. The tug of war comes as senators continue to look for solutions. The creation of gun violence restraining orders, something that will give law enforcement and close family members the option of obtaining a court order to prevent gun sales or remove guns from individuals who pose a threat. And here's the most important piece. For far too long, the Department of Justice has failed to prosecute felons and fugitives who try to illegally buy firearms. In the year 2010, 48,000 felons and fugitives tried to illegally buy a firearm. The Obama Justice Department prosecuted 44 of them. The low prosecution rates conservative Senator Ted Cruz is referring to have also been a problem for both Republicans and Democrats in the White House. For Democrats, the top three priorities are taking guns away from people posing a clear danger, banning assault weapons, and expanding background checks. Senator Tim Kaine says Republicans need to listen to the president. They feel that he's persuasive, and if he is sincere in pushing the reasonable provision and a background check is the one I think that's the most important and the most doable, the most popular with the public, we can make it happen. Today, White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders said the president wanted to strengthen background checks, but did not commit to universal background checks. The magic number here in the Senate is 60. 60 senators will need to back a gun reform bill for it to pass. Without a clear path for any bills, the Senate Majority Leader says they're turning to other issues next week. Wyatt? Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvey. Thanks, Jason. At least 15 people are dead and 90 injured in a suspected terror attack in Burkina Faso's capital. Islamic extremists struck the French embassy and the country's army headquarters. The suspects set fire to a truck and set off several explosives. Prime Minister Theresa May says the British people have to face hard facts about leaving the European Union next year. We both need to face the fact that this is a negotiation and neither of us can have exactly what we want. But I am confident that we can reach agreement. May wants European leaders to work with her to deliver, quote, a bold economic partnership. The United Kingdom is set to leave the EU next March. An Australian prosecutor is dropping one of the charges against Cardinal George Pell. Pell, who is the Vatican's finance minister, is the most senior Catholic leader to face prosecution. The 76-year-old was charged last year with offenses in his home state of Victoria. The details of the charges have not been made public. Cardinal Pell strongly denies the charges and vows to fight them. The Vatican confirms Pope Francis will travel to Geneva, Switzerland in June. The goal? To promote unity among Christians. Today that we look at this as a pilgrimage, as a way of finding new ways together and to do together what we can do together. And under this perspective, we thought uh, a visit of Pope Francis could also come at a time that could strengthen our common vision for ecumenism of today. The announcement was made today in the Vatican by the General Secretary of the World Council of Churches. He's a Lutheran from Norway. Swiss Cardinal Kurt Koch, head of the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity, joined him. Edward Penton, Rome correspondent for the National Catholic Register, joins us. Edward, what is the World Council of Churches? And, and tell us more about the background to this visit. How did it come about? Well, it first of all came about right away because uh, there was a delegation who met uh, the Pope uh, last year, delegation for the World Council of Churches, and they said how nice it would be for him to come on this 70th anniversary of its foundation. Um, but it, the, the World Council of, Founda uh, of Churches is quite, it's a very large organization. It's supposed to make up, be made up of half a billion uh, half a million rather, half a million Christians from 110 countries and 348 different uh, denominations including the, the Orthodox churches. So it's, it's a big uh, movement within the ecumenical movement. 
So why is then so Pope Francis so keen on marking this occasion and being there? Well, it really is connected with his uh, real uh, enthusiasm for ecumenism. You've seen this uh, over the past five years in, with his uh, reaching out to the, to the Orthodox churches, meeting Patriarch Kirill in a very uh, historic visit. Um, he's also uh, was very uh, keen on, on marking the, the 500th anniversary of the Reformation uh, in 2016. So this is really just another step along that way. It's interesting because the Catholic Church has actually never been a member of this organization, the World Council of Churches. Uh, why is that? It's really because, uh, well, first of all, because they're made up of what the church considers breakaway uh, denominations and uh, schismatic uh, groups, if you like. And so they don't feel, the church doesn't feel that it really should belong in that, uh, in that group. Um, but on the other hand, uh, and also because the church feels that it has its, it is the source of unity, the Petrine office is in itself uh, a source of unity, it is a, a unifying force. And so they feel that uh, there is really no need to be a member. On the other hand, it does offer consultation and is an observer to some of the meetings uh, within the World Council of Churches. Sure, and like we say, the Pope is at least willing to meet with them and engage with that organization as well. So this meeting is going to be happening in Switzerland. Tell us about Catholics in Switzerland. Can you give us a snapshot of what the church is like there? Yes, there are three million Catholics in Switzerland, Wyatt, and they make up about 40% of the population. Uh, they're sort of mixed around in the different cantons, uh, but there is a deep uh, Catholic heritage here uh, in, in Switzerland. And uh, in fact, the bishop um, who will be the, who is the bishop of Geneva, uh, is Bishop Charles Moro, who was here in Rome for many years and was actually very uh, involved in ecumenical dialogue with the Anglicans. So there's that significant point as well. But it is a very Catholic, has a very Catholic heritage, uh, Switzerland, in different parts of it. Very good. We will look forward to hearing more about this meeting as we get closer. Edward Pinton, Rome correspondent for EWTN's National Catholic Register. Thanks, Edward. Thanks, Wyatt. Coming up, footing the bill. We discuss the impact of the opioid crisis on taxpayers and lights in the sky. We take you to a traditional ceremony in Taiwan. Welcome back. I'm Wyatt Goolsby in for Lauren Ashburn. President Trump says the nation's drug problem will never be solved without getting tough on dealers. We have pushers and we have drug dealers that don't I mean, they kill hundreds and hundreds of people, and most of them don't even go to jail. You know, if you shoot one person, they give you life, they give you the death penalty. One of the president's friends described losing his son to opioids, but many Americans may not know the crisis is closely linked to human sex trafficking. Dr. Sandra Morgan, director of the Global Center for Women and Justice at Vanguard University, joins us from Costa Mesa, California. She's an advocate for victims of sex abuse and drug trafficking. So, Sandra, what is the connection between the opioid crisis and human trafficking? Well, I think the intersection of these two crises issues is connected to what happens to children when they are drug endangered children. My first experience as a pediatric nurse admitting a 14 year old boy whose mother and stepfather were selling him for drugs was an eye opening experience. And I began to study the issues so that I could understand how to stop that, how to prevent it. It's amazing to think what happens to some of those children. A, a recent report says opioid overdoses cost over $95 billion per year. It's a staggering statistic. How does that impact taxpayers? Well, I think if you start looking at that and reverse engineer, you think if we could do prevention, we could have that $95 million to improve our economy, to do prevention and make sure kids are safe. There are so many different ways, but the bottom line is prevention has to be funded. Yeah, that, that does seem to be the key here. And some police officers across the country are armed with a reversal drug to help victims who overdose. But a lot of advocates would agree that's not the solution long term. You mentioned prevention. What is the long term solution here? I think the long-term solution, this is a great era to be alive. We are studying brain plasticity and a recovery from addiction is possible. Our culture and our community, we have to change our attitudes. We don't look at um, an addict and think, oh, they made some moral 
bad choices, but we look at them and we think, are there children involved here? Do they need help? Is there a way to get them into a recovery program? Because your brain can learn new pathways. Your brain can uh, become healthy again. It takes a lot of work takes therapy, but look at the rewards. Children who make it to school on time, children who are not separated from their families, and even though they've suffered abuse, these kids still love mom and dad. What advice do you have for individuals who have an addiction? Get help. Call, um, call for whatever your local uh, recovery program has for you. We know that if we help you, you'll be a better parent, you'll be a, a more productive part of our community, and that makes everybody healthier. Such an important message and important to remember that addicts can recover. Sandra Morgan, director of the Global Center for Women and Justice at Vanguard University, thanks so much for talking with us. Thank you, Wyatt. I appreciate it. Moving on to European politics, German Chancellor Angela Merkel is showing her conservative party that she's still very much in charge and keen to shape its future. She has installed Annegret Kromp Karrenbauer in a top post in the Democrat, Christian Democratic Party. It could put the 55-year-old in a position to fill Merkel's shoes one day. Kromp Karrenbauer is a Catholic and opposed legalizing gay marriage in 2017. For more on this, we're joined by Martin Rottweiler, the managing editor and program director for EWTN's 24-hour German channel. He's based in Cologne, Germany. Martin, welcome back to the program. Welcome back to visiting the United States. Thank you. Uh, tell us more about this politician. We know that she's Catholic in particular, but how has she shaped public policy in Germany? I mean, Annegret Kramp-Karrenbauer uh, was a governor of a state, and she's, as a governor of state, she stated clearly that abortion is illegal, which is already a courageous thing to do. And secondly, now to, at the pre, in the present discussion, she is very much re rejecting an attempt to abolish a law that uh, prohibits doctors to promote abortion as a service. Uh, then she clearly has a clear stand on uh, against same-sex marriage. I think this is a very important thing uh, for her and, again, a courageous thing. And now as the new general secretary of the party, she's trying, uh, hopefully, to shape the party because she said, I want to open up a new discussion about the programmatic, um, programmatic or the program of the party of the Christian Democrats. Sure, you mentioned the abortion issue. Obviously, that's so important here in America. It shapes the way Catholics vote and think about what they think about when they go into a voting booth. When German Catholics go into a voting booth, what do they think about? What's the big issues? I think the big issues naturally are abortion. The big issue is also marriage and family, which is a big topic. But another big topic is gender ideology, because gender ideology is attacking also elementary schools in terms of sex, um, sex education is introduced in a way according to gender ideology. And naturally, many people are opposed to that, not only Catholics, but uh, there are people, I mean, people that are really taking care of their kids, they are concerned about this very much. How do you think, is there any sense of optimism that this can be uh, overcome? Just because I know Germany, one of the challenges in Germany is that it's very secular. Obviously, as parts of Europe become very secularized. It's very difficult because naturally tolerance in a wrong understood way uh, is always uh, a big, big topic. So, yeah, whether gender ideology um, becomes, a, um, you know, will be overcome, I hope so. And I think, again, it's according to natural, because people, you know, it's according to natural law to be against that. And I think mm -hmm. people who have, an under, who, have a, who have an understanding of that and take care of their children, they will probably understand what it means. Yeah. Well, it's so interesting to hear about these important issues, abortion, life, gender identity, are some of the same topics that are being discussed in Germany as well as in the United States. Martin Wattweiler, the managing editor and program director for EWTN in Cologne, Germany, thanks so much for talking with us about Thank it. Thank you. Hundreds of people gather in Taiwan for a spectacle in the night sky. Visitors from Taiwan and around the world are attending the Lantern Festival. It ends the 15-day celebration of Chinese New Year. It takes place on the night of the first full moon. Up next, pro-life dispute. We discuss the rift between bishops in Texas and the state's largest pro-life group. And going public, the royal wedding in England in the spring will feature some atypical guests.
Francis joins Vatican officials to pray on this Friday in Lent in the Mother of the Redeemer Chapel inside the Vatican. Father Contala Mesa, a Capuchin, focused his homily on living charity. The Iowa State approves a bill banning abortions once a baby's heartbeat is detected. The measure also requires doctors test women before an abortion to find a heartbeat. The state's Catholic bishops praise the legislation. It now moves on to the state's House of Representatives, which has a Republican majority. Political candidates are expressing concern after the Texas bishops cut ties with Texas Right to Life, the state's largest pro-life group, earlier this week. Victor Leal is a Republican running for state Senate. He tells the Odessa American newspaper, quote, I'm a pro-life Catholic who's deeply committed to my faith. However, I question the timing of the bishops on this statement. I'm also leery when bishops wade into the political arena. Joining us now via Skype is Bishop Michael Sis of the Diocese of San Angelo in Texas. He's a member of the Texas Catholic Conference of Bishops. Your Excellency, you're asking pastors, parishes, and Catholic schools to refrain from asking Texas Right to Life representatives to come to church events. Explain to us why. Well, first of all, I think it's really important to remember that this was a note to our pastors. It was not a public press release. And the whole logic of this message to our pastors is this. That is, a bishop is entrusted to teach the Catholic faith to the people of their diocese. And a pastor is responsible for guiding the faithful in their parish in understanding, a comprehensive understanding of Catholic teaching under the guidance of the local bishop. And of course, Texas Right to Life has not been entrusted with that mission. That's not in their job description. It's not the responsibility of Texas Right to Life to define Catholic teaching. So, Your Excellency, what will happen to those pastors who don't follow suit? Are there any repercussions? No, we have, we have not put forth any particular policy of that nature. Okay. We just want to make sure that our, our pastors know that if a parishioner goes to a Catholic parish and they see that the parish is recruiting for this particular organization, they might get the impression that Texas Right to Life represents us, but they have not been entrusted with the role of representing us. Some people may not fully understand that. I know you're getting some backlash from some pro-life Texans and politicians. Uh, what do you say to those critics who say you're going after the group for being too pro-life? Well, first of all, it's not the point of this memo to our pastors to malign any particular organization. It's just about the clarity in the use of our facilities and the clarity of our teaching. I think it's really important for everyone to keep in mind, not only in Texas, but across the whole country, that we need to keep in mind the big picture. And that is that our goal is to build a culture of life in this country and around the world. The there, battle for defending the sanctity of life in our country is not over. There are about 8.3 million Catholics in Texas. It's a state that has a lot of pro-life grassroots activity. How should pro-life Texans promote life then in your view? I think it's very important for all people who participate in the pro-life movement to try to find common ground and work together with mutual respect and a spirit of collaboration so that we present a united front because our message will be so much more effective if we're united with one another. Okay, very good. Sounds like, like I said, such an important message and important that, that you as the, as the bishop clarify uh, some of these important statements. Uh, bishop Michael Sis the, with the Diocese of San Angelo, thanks so much for talking with us today. Thank you. God bless you and keep up the good work. Prince Harry and his fiancée, Meghan Markle, will open up the grounds of Windsor Castle for their May wedding to nearly 3,000 Britons from all walks of life. The number does not include guests invited inside the 15th century castle's chapel, which has room for 800. Prince Harry, fifth in line to the British throne, and Markle, an American actress, say they want members of the public to feel part of the wedding celebration. And finally tonight, imagine you hear the doorbell ring and it's Pope Francis. Well, that happened today to one lucky group. The Holy Father paid a surprise visit to women who are being held on minor offenses. The Pope exchanged gifts with the five mothers, their children, and staff. He stayed about an hour. These visits have come to be known as Mercy Fridays. So it's always nice to see the Holy Father preaching mercy and giving people a message of hope. And with that, it wraps up our newscast for tonight and for this week. For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, thank you for watching. I'm Wyatt Goolsby. Good night and God bless.